Latonia is back as our TA for the week. Latonia, do you want to share anything about what you remember at this point in the program when you started SQL, if you enjoyed the week, if you hated the week, where you were at? I think I was nervous about getting through it, but as we got further along in the material, I was fine. It wasn't as much of a challenge as I thought it was going to be. So yeah, and the typical stuff. I think anyway, to start out anxious and then get more comfortable with it. Absolutely. Um, so we are headed into our first back end week, right? So when we think about back end, we think about two things. We think about the database of where that information lives. Uh, well, I guess three things. One, the database. Two, the API server or our API server that we are going to learn to build starting next week. Um, and then three is, of course, DevOps, right? Of, hey, once we build this stuff, once we interact with the database, once we get our API servers running on our computers, how do we deploy this, right? So um, for three decades or four decades, backend was just considered, oh, that's your API servers. That's how all of this works, right? Um, but it turned out that the internet was so pervasive that, that when um, consumers started to look at things like that. They were scared by technical terms like APIs and servers and IP addresses and all of that kind of stuff, right? So um, what did they do instead? They Marketing came up with this and they said, oh, it's going to be the cloud and everything's going to exist in the cloud and just you don't need to know how the cloud works. It just works, right? Well, the cloud is just servers, right? It's just things running in a data center somewhere. But to consumers, they tried to like obfuscate that and try to say like, it's the cloud. You don't need to know how it works. But that is what we're going to start getting into this week, right? Of, well, but how does it work? How do we build that stuff, right? So Nathan will be coming back in in a couple of weeks. He'll be doing all of the DevOps side of things. Um, you're going to learn um, AWS, Amazon Web Services, which is by far the biggest um, cloud platform there is out there. Um, but we are going to start this week with SQL. And I have been told by other students that SQL tends to be one of the easier modules, um, mainly because, yes, while it is new syntax, we get to learn it at a slightly different pace than what we're used to, right? So we're not sprinting through SQL. Um, we are going to use Khan Academy for the first two nights of SQL. And then the last night you get uh, my traditional teaching style back. We're going to go through, we're going to get... Um, um, the database server set up on your computer. We're going to be executing our queries. We're going to be doing all of that. Two things to, to call your attention to in Canvas. Um, one is our um, weekly homework assignment has already been posted. Um, it is due on Sunday. Um, and it is to go through all 18 exercises on here. Uh, it's called sqlbolt.com. And this is just going to give you a little bit of practice. So you go begin lesson one. They're going to uh, remind you of all of the content. And then when you scroll down to this exercise, it's going to say, put the uh, find the title of each film, right? This will probably not make any sense to you right now. But as we go through Khan Academy, as you start reading through this content, um, it will uh, probably start to make more sense. Before we dive into Khan Academy, does anyone have uh, any questions about the databases, about why we're learning it, about anything in general about this upcoming module or modules? Um, I do. I'm not yeah. familiar. So I just want to know, does this have anything to do with like what we've been doing, with like React and all of that, but we're like moving to another? Um, it isn't related to React directly, but it will be incorporated all in. So um, what we've been seeing in React so far is that we've made a couple components and like think back to the blog project, right? Our blog posts that we create them, we put them in this JavaScript local storage. But if you deployed that out onto the internet and go write a couple blog posts, right, and send that to your friend, they're going to pull up your website and be like, I don't see any of your blog posts. Well, local storage is, as the name implies, local, right? It's only on your computer. 
So we need some better place to save those blog posts or to save when someone uh, maybe in a capstone that is for a pet adoption, right? They need some way to be able to say, hey, I've got a new dog available to adopt. They fill out that form. They hit the save button. Where does that information go? Where does that get saved? Well, we can send it up to our API that we're going to learn how to build next week. But once that information gets to the API server, what happens if that server reboots? All of the memory is going to get wiped out. You're still going to have your code running. But where does that information get saved long term? So if you want to think about it as um, a database, is just like an Excel spreadsheet, except it's easier to program. It's easier for us, once we learn the SQL in, uh, syntax, to be able to do all four CRUD operations. What do we mean by CRUD? Create, read, update, delete, right? Those are our four main data operations, no matter what kind of data that we're working with. You need to be able to create it, to be able to insert it into the database, to have it saved somewhere. Once it's created, you need the ability to read it, right? You need the ability to get that data back out and show that on a page somewhere. You need the ability to update it in case that information changes and we don't want to just, you know, get rid of all of it. We only want to change a, a portion of it. And then we need to be able to delete it as well and to say, hey, this one thing in the database, just go ahead and get rid of that whole thing. So it isn't necessarily a React concept and it isn't necessarily a JavaScript concept. Although we will be using the data in the database queried by our, our SQL, which is going to flow into our JavaScript code, which will ultimately uh, be making an API call from our React code, right? So it, they do all fit together. It's not like um, databases are entirely siloed, but it is entirely possible to be a full-time database engineer. So if you really like SQL, you could get to the end of this course and be like, I like full stack. I like all of that stuff. But what I really want to be doing is specializing in the database. I want to learn how to properly design things in the database. I want to learn how to uh, write really efficient queries. Um, we're going to be writing like five to 10 lines worth of SQL uh, by, the, by the end of this module. But it is entirely possible to write hundreds or if not thousands of lines of SQL queries when we're working with really complex data types. Um, and it also opens up the world to uh, data analysts as well, right? Because a lot of data is out there, but we can't as humans actually use data, right? The computer can store data, that's fine, but data isn't actually usable until we turn it into information. Hey, it's great that we have 10 million rows of insurance claims that have been submitted in the past year, right? For let's say Excelis, but Excelis can't take those 10 million rows and do anything helpful with it until they turn it into information, until they say, oh, it turns out that here was our most expensive claim, or, oh, it turns out that this category of claims is costing us a lot of money, or, oh, uh, we spent X number of dollars last year on vaccines, right? Whatever it is, that's what SQL is going to help us with. SQL is not only good at uh, inserting that information and updating that information, it is also good at um, giving us a, a syntax, right, to be able to do all four of those important database operations. You are not technically required to have a database in your um, capstone. Um, you are required to make an API call in your capstone and have your own API set up. Don't panic on that. We're covering that next week. We are going to be covering that until almost to the end of the program, um, short of DevOps and, and the career week. So that's coming down the pipeline. Um, but the database is something that we will work our way up to through in-class projects. And then at some point, you'll hit that tipping point where you'll go, all right, I understand this enough that I want to go try that in my capstone. Um, that is not a, uh, a point that you need to hit this week, um, but it is coming down the line.
I am actually realizing that I posted the wrong required homework. Um, there's a different required homework. So I'm actually going to unpublish that. Um, hold your horses on that. I will move that over to an optional assignment um, and then uh, republish the uh, one during break. Don't worry, it's a much harder assignment, the one that's now that's going to be required, just to give you a little bit of fun. Now it will help help you more with your capstones, which is why I want to switch it out. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. Um, Two logistics things. One, open hack is this Thursday uh, downtown at Common Space. We will not be having class so that you guys can attend open hack. Um, hope to see you guys all there. Hopefully, you've recovered from uh, happy hour and all the Lemoyne uh, networking events. Hopefully, you've got uh, energy. Hopefully, you've got business cards left that you can share down at open hack with each other. Um, so hopefully we'll see you open hack Thursday, 6 PM. If you want to sign up, the, the meetup link is there. Um, but you do not, uh, you don't need to, you can just show up. Um, Shannon, there's no such thing as too much talking. And if there is, it's clearly a lesson I have not learned. Okay. The other logistic thing is tomorrow you can get out of class um, if you complete the second half of the Khan Academy um, assignments that we are going through. So I will post a link in the chat. These are the um, things that we will be going through tonight. Um, if you take a look at this, we are going to go through all of these sections, right? So all the way down to um, the further learning in SQL. Um, it is broken down into a little video that you watch, and then there is a little challenge that we'll be doing in class. So if you would like, you can get a get out of jail free card and not have to attend class tomorrow. If you send me a screenshot that you have completed each one of these, they should have that little blue check mark uh, next to them. If you shoot me that as a Slack message, you are welcome to skip class tomorrow. With all of that said, let's go ahead and dive in. And I need to make sure I can share my sound as well. Maybe, why won't it let me optimize for video clip? Optimize screen sharing for best, zoom in other windows, maybe mass and black box. Okay, I don't know why it's not gonna let me do that, but that's okay. The world is full of data. Every app that you use is full of data. On Khan Academy, we store data about users and badges and progress. On Facebook, they store data about who you are, who your friends are, what they're posting. On Bank of America, they store data about how much money you have and what accounts that's in. How do these apps store data? Well, they use a database, which is a program that helps store data and provides functionality for adding, modifying, and querying that data and doing that all fast. Databases come in many forms, but a really popular type of database is called a relational database. It stores each kind of data in a table, which is kind of like storing data in a spreadsheet. A row represents an item, and a column represents properties about that item. For example, to store data about Khan Academy users, we'd have a users table with a row for each user and columns for properties like their nickname and location. Relational databases make it particularly easy to form relationships between tables. For example, in order to store Khan Academy users and their badges, we might have a users table and a badges table, and then a user badges table to remember which users earned which badges, just by mapping user IDs to badge IDs. That's a more efficient form of storage than having to repeat everything about the user and everything about the badge in the user badges table. Most databases come with a query language to interact with the database. 
SQL is a language designed entirely for accessing databases and is the most popular of them. With SQL, we can create tables, change data, get back to data that we're interested in, like we want to find out which users joined in the last week or which users have a particular badge. That's what we're going to teach here, and you'll actually get to try out SQL here in the browser using SQL Lite, a particular implementation of it. You won't be able to write the whole app here, but when you're done learning SQL, you'll have a much better understanding of how data is stored in the apps that you use and be able to use SQL if you ever build an app. So for me, when I was learning SQL, um, I was like, all right, why do I need this, right? This seems like a lot to learn when all I'm really doing is things that Excel can accomplish, right? But a basic spreadsheet, we can't write a query. We can't write some code to update the data there, right? And that's what SQL excels at. Databases are good at not only storing a couple hundred or a couple thousand rows of data, they're good at storing millions and millions of rows of data. So because we need that efficiency, because we need to be able to access the data in there programmatically, that's why we learn SQL. Uh, our web app is full stack technically when we just build our own API, but... Um, um, but we need to um, we need to be able to access that information from our API, and that's the reason that we need uh, SQL. Any questions? Don't worry, we'll get hands on after this next video. Actually, I do have a question. Welcome to my oh, database. No. It has no data. Shoot. Um, so we're using SQL databases for this uh, module, right? Yes. Um, so uh, only because my API for my capstone pulls off of Mongo database, and you said you use Mongo databases at work. What would be the quickest like difference between the two? Absolutely. Really good question. So um, there are two types of databases. There are SQL databases and the other kind of SQL database, I'm not kidding you, is called a NoSQL database, N-O-S-Q-L. Um, the uh, other way of thinking about that, um, there are relational databases, which almost all SQL databases are relational databases. Um, the other type of database, a non-relational database. Geniuses really came up with, with that naming convention, didn't they? So basically, um, what happens in a relational database is you um, define what is called a schema, which is basically a structure of the data. Um, what are the columns going to be? What are the data types of those columns going to be? Hey, I may have um, a teacher called tables, uh, a table called teachers, and what do I need to store in that? I need to store um, their name and their email address and, I don't know, maybe their date of birth so that HR has it or whatever. So I'm going to use a date data type for that. Um, well, now I go, well, I want to store the students' information as well, right? What students um, is assigned to what teacher? Well, in SQL, what we can do, because it is a relational database, is we can define that relation using what we call a pr primary key and a foreign key, which will be coming up shortly. Don't worry about it uh, too much for now. But we can basically tie those two tables together. And if you kind of think Venn diagram, we can say, hey, this teacher is related to these other students in this other table. That's all SQL, that's all relational databases. Well, that sounds like a pretty good idea. If that all works, then why do we have non-relational databases? Why do we have no SQL databases? Well, what um, databases like Mongo, no SQL, non-relational, um, are really good at is just say, hey, here's this data, hold on to it for me. And this data format may change, right? This structure may change. I may have a teacher with no students assigned to them, so I'm not even gonna tell you about the students. And when the students are assigned to them, that's when I will, I will take care of updating that data and storing that data. So there are pros and cons to each. It is not a um, de facto 
hey, I'm always going to use this database because this is the better one. Sometimes it depends on your data structure. Sometimes the data that you're storing is very dynamic. The keys in it can change a lot. You may not know the, the structure of it in advance. Um, and that is when Mongo uh, or other non-relational databases really excel. However, um, I don't have the like a stat to point to this, but the majority of databases used are SQL or relational databases, right? I don't know if that majority is 80% or 51%, but um, the non-relational databases are considered a little bit newer, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are better or that you want to switch over to them. The majority of um, Syracuse companies, of local companies, use SQL. And oftentimes, if you're in a big enough organization, you'll find that they actually use both database types depending on the project. So it isn't um, the concepts that you're learning in SQL and relational databases are translatable over to Mongo. And if you have a, like your data set, right, is already in Mongo. Um, so we'll, during a one-on-one, -on -one, we can talk about how to connect to that and, and how um, at the end of next week, you'll see kind of how to do everything in SQL and be like, okay, well, how do I pull this off in Mongo? But the kind of cool thing is, is it doesn't matter if your data is sitting in Mongo or sitting in SQL, the way you connect to that data is going to be different in your API. But once it hits your API, all of that information is going to come back as JSON. So it doesn't matter where you're, what kind of database you're using. Once it gets through your API, your API is always going to provide that, that data in a JavaScript object notation format. Um, and because of that, it doesn't matter if you're writing your back end in Python and your front end in React and your database in, in Mongo, because your API is always going to send data back in JSON. Um, so our particular stack that we are learning is React on the front end, Node.js and a framework called Express on the back end. And then we will be using our um, Postgres database, P-O-S-T-E-G-R-E-S, -E -E or Postgres QL is the other uh, name for it. And then we will be um, learning how to use two packages, one called PG, short for Postgres, that allows you to connect into the database. Um, and then another one called SQLize, which we uh, call an ORM, an object relational mapper. That will become more clear uh, next week. Never got a short answer from me, but hopefully that answered some questions. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, how do you get back into that um that Khan Academy? I just put a link into the chat. Thank you. And it should, uh, no, it's not linked in Canvas. That's how I was looking at the assignments, and I know you just took one down, but I didn't wasn't clear on if you put it back up or. No, I haven't put that one back up. I did also post an optional reading assignment uh, with a couple of links in here um, for if if you were a reader, if you like uh, to have that background, you are welcome to check these out. But these are totally optional, and you don't need to submit submit anything. Oh, just submitting is the first. Um... It will be the um, SQL bolt thing if you want to do that as an optional assignment, but I'll have that cleaned up at break so it will be more clear in Canvas. So just to give you context here, whatever we write over on the left side here is going to be our SQL queries. And then whatever shows up on the right side here is going to be like the results of our SQL query. So let's go ahead and dive in there. Welcome to my database. It has no data in it yet because I want to build it up with you. What sort of data should we store in our first table? Let's start with a grocery list, which you've probably used in real life. I'm pasting an example list, which has three delicious items and how much we want to buy of each of them. Our first bit of SQL will be the command to make the table to store this list. 
I'll write create table in all caps and then the name of the table groceries and then parentheses and a semicolon. We see an error pop up because the SQL interpreter expects to see column names inside these parentheses. What column should we have in order to describe each item on our list? Well, first we need a name for the item, which I'll call name. And we need to follow that with a data type. We have a few options. Let's go for text. If we look on the right hand side, we can see our new table is listed with one column. But we also need to specify how many of each thing to buy, like our four bananas. So let's add a quantity column as well. And this will always have a whole number, so let's use an integer for that data type. And now we can see that new column listed in our table. That looks pretty good if we're thinking about what data we have in this grocery list, but we're missing something that we need in databases, a unique identifier for each row. We almost always need unique IDs for each row in a database because we need a way to identify rows later when we're updating or deleting them and not be dependent on other columns because those could change. We typically specify this ID column first. So I'm moving my cursor before name. Uh, I'll call this column ID, which that's standard. And then for the data type, I'll have to write this phrase integer primary key, which signals to the database that it should treat this as the row identifier and that each row must have a unique value for this column. Okay, now we have our grocery table with three columns in it. It's empty though, so let's put some data in it. We'll write insert into, and then the table name, groceries, then values, and then parentheses, and here we start listing the column values in the order that we declared the columns. The first column was ID, so I'll put one, so we haven't used that ID yet. The second column is name, so I'll write bananas, and the third column was quantity, so I'll write four. Do you see how the schema updated on the right? It now says that there's one row in the groceries table. So our insertion worked. Let's add the next two items and just doing the same thing. Insert into groceries, values, two, peanut butter. I want just one of those because otherwise I eat too much. And insert into groceries, values, and ID three, dark chocolate bars have to be dark. Milk chocolate is not even chocolate. And we'll get two of those. Okay, so it says three rows, um, but to really see that the database actually contains data, you can click the table name on the right. This will insert a select statement in your code. And don't worry too much about this now because we'll get to it in the next video. If you want, you can pause the talk through and try clicking the table name yourself to see what happens. That's it. That's all we needed to create our first table and add data to it. It's pretty cool, huh? In the next section, we'll see how to get the data back out of the table in more interesting ways. Boring said in the chat, um, so we'll be repeating ourselves a lot. I wouldn't necessarily consider it repeating yourself, right? Once you run this create table uh, command, it's done. It's saved. It's in your database. We will be learning a tool on, th on Wednesday called Beekeeper Studio. And it's basically like GitHub Desktop or um, VS Code. It's a way that we can visually, or Postman, um, we can visually kind of see what's going on with our database. And we can insert data into that database without having to write SQL queries directly. Um, but learning how to write these SQL queries gives us kind of the full power of, of SQL and uh, allows us to access all of that kind of data. Um, so in this case, because we're inserting three different rows worth of data, um, yes, we are going to uh, repeat that insert command over and over again until we get all of the data in. Okay. So now we move into this challenge. Um, you guys should pull up the link that I sent at 557, click into this challenge, this book list database, and this is what you guys are going to be working on. So um, what it will say is there are uh, two steps to each one of these problems. This one will say, what are your favorite books? You can make a database table to store them. In the first step, create a table to store your list of books. It should have columns for name and shrink. So up here, there's a little hint to get you started. But 
it is probably helpful for you to go back to that last video, put the cursor all the way, the, the play bar uh, scrubber all the way at the end, and it's going to show you all of the code that got covered in that video. So take a minute, go back, reference this, make sure you understand it, then come back over to this book list database and try and complete step one and two. When you are done, head back over to Zoom and vote in the poll that just got posted. Don't forget to head back to Zoom and vote in the poll if you are able to get it working. Or if you have a question, don't hesitate to ask. All right, let's give this a try together, see if you guys. So I'm looking at this and it's like, create a table. I don't, there's new syntax, right? We got to figure out what a, a new table is. So I go back here and I'm going to fast forward through the video all the way down to the end. And here's this create table command. That's what we want to be working with. So I'm going to copy this whole thing, go back over to my book list database and just paste it here. I am going to comment that out with my command slash. You'll notice the comment syntax in SQL is a little different. That's OK. That's still commented. And now that I have this to reference, I can practice what they're asking me to do up here. So it says, what are your favorite books? You can make a database table to store them. OK, so my table name is probably going to be books. Um, it should have uh, columns for ID, name, and rating. OK, so I'm going to say create table books, then I need to tell it what my columns are going to be. Books is my table name. My columns are going to go in the parentheses. And the ID is always going to be an integer in uh, SQL. And we're going to tell it, hey, the primary key is what is it is uh, keeping track of the information here. I also need 
a uh, name column, and that is going to be a type of text. And I also need a rating. And my rating is going to be like a one through five, right? So I'm probably going to do that as an integer. So I look over here, and it looks like my schema is, next, is correct. And if I scroll down, I should be able to hit next step. Do we have any questions about that syntax? Can I just share something? Yeah. When I pulled it up on my end, not my screen, but I was typing it in on the first video because I didn't realize, I didn't hit play and I didn't know it was typing it in for me. Anyways, just. <laughs> yeah, make sure that you are on the, the challenge screen, not on the creating a table screen um, so that you can complete the, the challenge and make sure it's it's telling you it's right. Okay, so now we move on to the next one, which says, okay, now add three of your favorite books into the table. Well, we could go back here and look at creating a table, um, but wouldn't it be nice if we had some reference documentation for this? Well, W3 Schools has us covered. So if I do a search for W3 Schools SQL, and this I do have linked in Canvas, um, you can see over here, They've got a bunch of things. And so if I go into their SQL tutorial and take a look at their sidebar, you can see there are all kinds of commands over here that we are referencing. So if we go down here and look, we have an insert into. And this is going to tell us, okay, insert into the table name, and then we need to put in the values and whatever we want to insert. So we're going to practice that. We're going to say insert into my books table, the values, and what values do I want to put in? Well, it has to line up with the columns that I created up here. So I'm going to create my ID one, and the name, because it is a string, I'm going to put it in quotes, just like I do in JavaScript. I will say Harry Potter, and a rating of four. Then I can copy and paste this two more times. I need to make sure that my ID is unique. So I'm going to change this to two and three. We'll learn uh, down the road how we can make that ID auto increment for us. So it will automatically generate the ID for us. Then I'm going to change up my books. I'm going to say Aragon. And uh, I don't know, Winnie the Pooh. Now, to make sure that that's working, I can come over and click on my books. And we're going to learn about this select statement in a second. But you can see I've got my three books created in my database. Good. Anyone have questions? Okay, Doc. On to the next. We're back with our groceries table, but we've expanded on it a bit. It now has a column for which aisle number we can find the item at the supermarket. Plus, we've added a few more items. Now you can really see the power of SQL in different ways that you can retrieve data from your database. And this is also where it can get a bit tricky. To start off simple, how would we retrieve all the rows from our table? To perform any query, we write select, and then which columns we're interested in, like the name, and then from, and the table name that we're selecting from. And we can see a list of the groceries on the right under that result section. But what if we want all of the column names? We can just replace name with star. And that was also the query that got inserted when you click the table name, which you might remember from the first talk through. This list is out of order, though. If we went from top to bottom at the store with this list, we'd have to keep changing aisles. We'd rather have it ordered by aisle so that we can be more efficient at the store. To do that, we can just add an order by clause to our query, specifying which column we want to order by. Ah. That's better. 
Now we can get our ingredients faster. But to be even more efficient, my brother and I like to shop together and split the store so that I shop in half the store, he shops in the other half, and we meet at the checkout. There are 12 aisles at this grocery store, so for my list, I just want to know which items are in aisles 6 through 12. Well, anytime we want to filter results out, we can use a WHERE clause for this and specify the column name and then what we want to compare it to. So in this case, I used a greater than operator, but there's lots of different comparison operators depending on what it is we're trying to filter by. Great. So now, now I know exactly what items I'm going to get. I'm going to be really efficient. And you've learned a few ways to use SQL to query. Now stay tuned to find out even more ways that you can select. Okay, so we're seeing more syntax. We've seen the insert. We have now seen select. We have to include what columns we want, or if we want all the columns, we just say star. We have our from, and it always needs to know what table we're pulling this from because we will see that we can have multiple tables. Then we saw this where. This where is like a filter query, right? We're saying, hey, we only want to see where the aisle is greater than five in our results. And then we also have this order by, which is another uh, SQL command to say, hey, let's sort some of this data. So move on to the box office challenge. Go ahead and, oops giving you the answer, go ahead and try this one. Here are all of the box office uh, hits and their release year. In this challenge, you're going to get the results back out of the database in different ways. In the first step, just select all the movies. Well, what do we need in our select statement? We need the keyword select. We need to include what columns we want, which there are two ways of doing that. We need our from keyword and we need our table name. All right, let's give that a try. We're going to say select, and I want to say all of my columns. So I'm going to put in a star or an asterisk from my movies table. I put a semicolon at the end of the query, and I am good to go. I got all of my movie titles. So I move on to the next step. Now add a second query after the first that only retrieves the movies that were released in the year 2000 or later, not before then sort the results so that the earlier movies are listed first. Should have two select statements after this step. So they don't want me just to modify this select. They want me to write an entirely new one. And it says only the movies that are released in the year 2000. But I still want the name and the release year to show up in my results. So I'm still going to select star from movies, but I'm going to modify this query a little bit. I'm going to say where the release year, I have to match the column name over here. The column name is release year, is uh, 2000 or later, right? So I want my greater than or equal to there. And then what's the second part? Well, if we look at what our query is coming back, 09, 04, 09, so we're good there. Then what else do I need? Order by the earliest movies listed first. So I do that by saying order by release year. And now I get my release years sorted the way I want. Good. Anyone have questions? Stoke. We're back with our grocery list. I can see that it has six rows in it, but I can also see that we need to buy more than one of each item, like our bananas. So I'm not sure offhand how many items we'll end up buying total. And I'd like to know that total number so that when we're cashing out, we could just do a quick check to see if we have the right number of items in our cart. Well, to do that in SQL, we can use what's called an aggregate function. 
an aggregate function is useful for things like getting the maximum, minimum, sum, and average of values in our database. In this example, to get the total number of items, we'll start with select, then the name of the aggregate function we'll be using, sum, then the name of the column we want, and then from the name of the table we're selecting from. Ta-da! So we can see on the right that the sum is 15, so we should have 15 items in our cart if we got everything correctly. And notice if I go up here and change the number of bananas, because you know I'm gonna invite my monkey friends over for a jungle party, we can see the sum increase in real time and get bigger and bigger, so we know that we're now gonna need 67 items in our cart. Now we could easily try out other aggregate functions here because sum's not the only one. So if we wanted to know what is the most that we'll be buying of any one item, then we could use max. See, 56. Those are obviously our bananas. But this information is, is useful for this case. Let's go back to sum. Okay. Now what if we wanted to make sure we had the right number of items after each aisle? Well, we can do that in SQL using the group by clause. We add it to the end of a query, specifying the column name to group by aisle. Okay, so now we can see that in one aisle we'll have nine, another of one, but I don't actually know which aisle we're getting each of them in. So what we can do there is just add aisle to the beginning of the select. So there you can see, okay, so we're gonna get nine items in aisle two, one item in aisle four, 56 in aisle seven, and one in aisle 12. Awesome. Now, how did that actually work behind the scenes? The SQL engine first did the grouping of the rows based on aisle. So first did this group by, then it summed up the quantity in each of those groups, and then finally it selected the first aisle value that it saw in each group. And, you know, the aisle value was the same for all of them, so we got the aisles back out. But we could have also said name here, and we do see a name for, for each of the rows, but it's a bit misleading because for some of these aisles, there are actually multiple items in that group, but the SQL engine just picked the first item out of it. So you really shouldn't be using something different from what you're grouping by because you might not get a sensible result. So we'll say aisle, and now, now that's an accurate presentation of our data. Okay, so great. You've seen aggregate functions, you've seen group by, and now you can efficiently gather useful statistics on your data. Another tool for your SQL toolbox. Makes sense. Any questions? Group by, we're just taking all of these rows of data, grouping them together, and then when we call an aggregate function on them, it's taking all of that group together information and adding up the sums. All right. Give the next challenge a try on your own. Here's a table containing a to-do list with the number of minutes it will take to complete each item. Insert another item into your to-do list with the estimated minutes it will take. So you're going to practice your insert into down here. Okay, to practice that, I'm going to insert into my to-do list my values, and I have to make sure my ID is unique. We already went up to five, so I need to make my ID six. I am going to say finish class, and it's going to take us, what, another 90 minutes to finish class, another 120 minutes, another 126 minutes. Okay, um, it is mad at me because I forgot the keyword values. And now we are on to the next step. Select the sum of minutes it will take you to do all the items on your to-do list. You should only have one select statement. Okay, so I'm going to select 
the sum of my minutes from my to-do list. 261 minutes, where did that come from? Well, we can actually test that. We can look at our select here and show that our query results are showing 15, 20, 30, 50. Okay, well, that's not a very helpful query. I don't know what any of these tasks are. So I can go in here and I can say, hey, don't only select the minutes, also select the item. Now I can see the breakdown of all the minutes. But if we take all of these and add them up, we get our 261 minutes. Good. Anyone have questions? Anyone need a minute? Anyone think it should be working and it's not working? Okay. Let's go ahead and wrap this module up. At this point, you've probably heard me pronounce SQL two ways, SQL or SQL. Some of you might even be mad that I'm pronouncing it one way or the other, and you may have very good reason for believing that your favorite pronunciation is the correct one. So what's the deal? Well, SQL was originally invented at IBM in the early 1970s, and the first version was called SEQUEL, and it stood for Structured English Query Language. That acronym, SQL, was later changed to SQL because SQL was already trademarked by an airplane company and companies really don't like getting into trademark lawsuits. Nowadays, many of us still pronounce it SQL because it's shorter to say and we've got historical reasons to claim that it's the right way. However, when I surveyed developers across the world, I found that in non-English languages, many of them pronounce it SQL or, for example, S-A-Q-L-A -A in Spanish. Since our videos get translated here on Khan Academy, I figured I'd make it easier for translators to match the pace of our videos by pronouncing S-Q-L the long way. But in everyday life, I'm used to calling it SQL, so both of them come out of me. Now you know, it can be S-Q-L or SQL, and you'll probably hear both the rest of your life. The world is a messy place, but at least you now have a way of structuring your queries about it, right? Seems trivial. You will hear people pronounce it both ways. You will see that I pronounce it both ways. It is totally fine to pronounce it both ways. What it is not fine to do is on your resume, spell out SQL. If you are writing it down, if you're putting it in a message, use SQL, the letters. When you pronounce that, when you say, hey, I am learning SQL, you can pronounce it SQL or you can pronounce it SQL. Either is totally fine. If you would like, you can go ahead and push yourself on these projects. This is a good uh, way to practice and uh, make sure that you're fully understanding all the uh, concepts here. We are going to go ahead and skip these for the sake of time. So up to next lesson, lesson number two, and we will keep on going here, unless anyone has questions. Max? Yes. So during an interview and whatnot, I will say SQL or SQL, mm -hmm. the acronym, um, but would that be looked at as like a junior mistake to actually, you know, say structured Curry, the whole thing or something, why shouldn't you do it? Um, it's very rare for someone to actually spell out like structured query language. Yeah. Um, you can do that. What you shouldn't do is write on your resume S-E-Q-U-E-L, because that isn't used like that isn't isn't used anymore. SQL is is the agreed upon industry standard that Microsoft, Oracle, Postgres, SQLite, and MySQL all use. They all uh, do SQL. They're not saying S-E-Q-U-E-L anymore. 
Um, so pronouncing it either way is fine. But yes, it would be kind of looked at as like, what is S-E-Q-U-E-L? Like, like, what is the, that compared to the letters S-Q-L? So use a legal term for S-Q-L. Gotcha. Yes. Yep. I've spent the last few talk throughs making a grocery list. Well, now that I've realized how much eating I do, I realize what else I should be tracking in a database, how much exercise I'm doing. So I'll start by pasting in some statements that create a table and insert a few rows of data. Let's see what I have in exercise logs. We have an ID, of course, a type, which is a string like biking or dancing, minutes for how many I spent, calories for how many I burned, and heart rate for how high it went. Now I'm inserting the data using a slightly different syntax than before. Notice how I'm specifying the column names in parentheses after the table name. When I do that, it means that I don't have to specify every column value here. I only have to specify the ones that I give in this list of column names. Now, do you see which one I didn't specify here? The missing column is ID, and that's very much on purpose. ID, here we go. The ID column is the primary key in the table, and it's set to auto increment. That means that the database will automatically fill it in for us when we tell it to by picking an ID that's different from the other rows in the table, usually a number that's one bigger than the biggest number so far. Now, I would rather have the database figure that out than have me figure it out. So I usually like to do my inserts this way, leave out the ID, let the database do that work for me. OK, so there we go. My database table is set up. And it looks like I've even done a bit of exercise. Go me. Let's find out where I'm burning the most calories with a simple query. I'll just modify this one. So select from exercise logs where calories greater than 50. And we'll just order by calories as well. OK, so I've done two activities where I've burned more than 50 calories. And it looks like dancing burned the most. Now, I want to find out which activities I've done that have burned more than 50 calories, but also taken less than 30 minutes, because I want to exercise more efficiently in the future. It's, it's pretty obvious from looking at the current results. There's only two results. It's easy to look at that. But just imagine that there are thousands of rows. Maybe this is data from thousands of users. I would need a way to filter that down in the SQL query itself. To do that, I can use the AND operator to combine those multiple conditions, like to only return the rows where calories are greater than 50 and minutes are less than 30. Ha ha. So now I only see one result, dancing, which means I should just spend my whole life dancing, which sounds pretty good to me. OK, so in a similar way, I could use the OR operator to return rows that meet any of some conditions. Like, let's say, rows where calories are greater than 50 or heart rate is above 100. And that helps me find the most vigorous exercises. Now we can see that dancing and biking are both good. And actually, I do like biking. It's just a bit harder. Now you can have as many OR and AND operators in your query as you'd like. The AND operator has precedence over the OR if you've got both of them in the same query. But you can always use parentheses to change the order of evaluation, just like with math expressions. Now I want you to try these out in the next challenge and stay tuned for the next talk through where I'm going to show how to do some interesting things using this type column here. See you then. All right.
moving on to the challenge. Hopefully that's pretty self-explanatory here, just uh, being able to add in those and and or operators. So let's take a look at this one. So um, karaoke, we have a table of songs in this challenge. You will use queries to decide what songs to sing. For the first step, select all the song titles. Hopefully that that one is uh, pretty easy. We're going to go down to the bottom of our query. We're going to say select title from our songs database. Now we move on and it says, OK, next, maybe your friends only like singing recent or truly epic songs. Select, um, right, add another select that uses or to show the um, titles of the songs that have epic mood or a release date after 1990. Go ahead and give that a try. You're going to write that as another query, right? So you're still going to select title from songs. But we need to add in a condition here. Give it a try on your own. Okay, so we're going to say where, and we have to use the column names, right? So I'm going to go back up to my schema, and we are looking for where it was released after 1990, or where the mood is epic. We're going to use our quotes there. Uh, EPIC in lowercase, probably. And that will get us on to the next step. So let's finish this one up. Uh, people get picky at the end of the night. Add another select uh, that, show, that uses and to show the titles of the songs that are epic and released after 1990 and are less than four minutes long. So I'm going to use this as my starting point. I'm going to change my or to my and, and I am going to say that my duration is less than four. And I get even more responses than what I'm looking for. And I'm like, oh, uh, something's not right there. So I'm going to actually go up and look at my inserts and look at how this is getting inserted. This is very clearly the year, but this is number of seconds in the song, not the number of minutes in the song. So I could just change this over to seconds, or I can actually do a little bit of math here and say, hey, four minutes times 60 seconds a um, uh, 60 seconds in a minute, and that limits me down. And to just prove that that's working, I could do a select star from my songs and find out, hey, we need to look at all the durations here where the duration is going to be greater than 160 and epic and released after 1990. And that is going to give us our result. Good. Questions? All right, keep on trucking. I'm back with my table of exercise logs, and I've added a few more rows. 
Now, if I wanted to filter these logs to just show my biking logs, I could just add where type equals biking. Simple. It's getting sunny outside. So actually what I want to find is all of the outdoor activities, not just biking. Uh, so to do that, I can use the or operator that we just learned, checking each of the different outdoor types. So type equals hiking or type equals tree climbing or type equals rowing. Unfortunately, I don't yet have a mountain or a tree or a lake in my home. So all of these are outdoor activities. All right, so that worked, but there is actually a simpler way to do this query. And that's using the in operator. The in operator will check to see if a particular value is in a list of values. Let me show you. So we'll take this query and I'll paste it. And then I'm going to replace this equal sign with in and then put a parentheses. And then I'm just going to separate each of these strings with a comma instead of that whole long or type equals blah. Ta-da! Same results like we expected, but this query is easier to read and it's a bit shorter too. We could easily also do the inverse query if we just wanna see the indoor activities. Let me just write not in, ha. Huh. So that's just dancing and I'll save that for the winter time. Let's change it back to in and our outdoor activities. And I'm gonna show you something a little more interesting that we can do with in. First, I'm going to need another table of doctor recommended activities. I'll paste in the SQL for that. Let's see, where do we have it? Here. So here we've created a table of doctor recommended activities, which just has a type, which matches our type from up here, and a reason, which is why the doctor recommended it. Now, what if I wanted to see all my exercise logs that correspond to doctor recommended activities? Well, first, I might want to see what are those doctor recommended activities. So select type from doctor's favorites. Okay, biking and hiking. So I could just take this query and modify it and just shorten it to biking and hiking. However, if the doctor's favorite tables changed, like there was a new row added or a row deleted, then this query would be out of date. What I want is for this query to always be up to date with what's in this table here. So what I can do is use the in operator directly with the results of a SQL query, a select query. And it's actually very simple to do. I'll replace what's in the parentheses with the query that we did before. Ta-ta! Cool. So we call this inner query a subquery. It's the query that we're doing inside the outer query. And now this query will always pull based on whatever's in the doctor's table at the time. It will stay up to date. And this is a pretty simple subquery, but it could actually get really complex. It could be as complex as any of the queries that we've learned so far. Let me show you an example. What if we only want to select the favorites that the doctor recommended for cardiovascular reasons. So we could say where reason equals, and then we could paste this whole long reason in here and we see hiking. But what if for some reason we didn't have the period in here? Well, now we actually see nothing for that query because it's trying to do an exact match and it can't exactly match that. So there are times like this when we want to do an inexact match, and we can do that with the like operator, which is a pretty neat operator. And so to do that, we're just gonna take this, and I'm gonna replace the equal sign with like, and get rid of, because all we care about is that very important word, cardiovascular. That is what we're looking for. So we say cardiovascular, and we also put it percentage sign on either side, which acts as a wild card. So this should match any rows which contains the word cardiovascular anywhere. And it did. Yay. Okay. So that's, that's pretty cool. 
Whew. We covered a lot in subqueries like. Hopefully you're pumped to try them out in the next challenge or take a break, go climb a tree and come back. Either way, I hope you have fun with it. So here we've started to see multiple tables going on, right? We've got uh, two tables, our exercise logs and our doctor's favorites. We're starting to see how we can relate data in one to the other using their subqueries. Um, and we are also seeing this like keyword for the first time. This is triggering anything for you in your capstone. You should be thinking about, hmm, that would be good for search, wouldn't it? Oh, I'm searching for all of the rows that have the word cardiovascular in it. We're going to be using that light syntax to make your search work down the road. All right, let's tackle this in a challenge. Um, first step, select all the title uh, songs by the artist named Queen. OK, pretty easy. We've got our artist. We've got our songs. We're going to go right down to our select. We're selecting the title from the songs table where the artist is equal to queen. You might be tempted to use this artist table, but we don't need that. What are we? What data are we trying to get to? We're trying to get only to the songs, and we already have access to the artist right here. So that's the one that we're going to use. Okay. Now we have a pop playlist. In preparation, select all of the artists from the pop genre. Well, same deal over here. Genre is already in the artist table. So I'm going to say select all of the names from the artist table where the genre is equal to pop. All right, last one. To finish creating the pop playlist, add another query that will select the title of all the songs from the pop artists. It should use an in on a nested subquery that's based off of your previous query. OK, so it is saying, all right, I want to select um, the name of the song, right? Uh, title of the song from my songs uh, where, and then I need to use my in subquery. So I say, uh, from the songs where the genre is in, and then I'm going to select. And what am I trying to select? I am trying to select the name from the artists where the genre is pop. You can't find a genre. Oh, we got to match the column names. Select the genre from artists where the genre is pop. And missing something dumb. Let's take that out. That works. Oh, does it also need to select the genre? Oh, you know what it is? Where the artist is in the select the artist from the artist where the genre is pop. Let's 
select the title from the songs where the artist in the songs table is in a subquery that is selecting the artist's name from the artist table where the genre is pop. Okay, let's break that down. Sorry, I got confused on that one. So break our queries up. We're saying, all right, what are we trying to do? We are trying to get all of the titles of the songs where the artist is a pop artist. But we got to separate out that data and recognize where that's coming from. In order to know the title of all of the pop artist songs, I need to do my subquery. So I start by getting the name from my artist where the genre is pop. That is getting me all of the pop artists. But I, I tripped myself up here because I have to identify what am I selecting? I'm selecting the artist's name. If we look at the artist table, the column is name. Now, what do we want to line that up with on our songs table? We want to line that up with the artist here. So we use the name here because it's coming from the artist table, but we use artist here because the column is called artist in the songs table. Max, I have a question. Yeah. For this one, because it told us, it said, um, based on your previous query, was that sufficient for us to know we needed to nest that whole query? And we needed to nest it because they said use the in. So an in is always going to be a nested query. Right. But my question is, could we have just copied the whole line of 62 and popped it inside that in to nest it? Yes. Okay. Yep. Anyone have questions on that? We see why we use that subquery. Okay, joke. Let's do one more and then we can take a break. Let's continue with more queries of my exercise logs. Let's say that I want to see how many calories I've burned for each type of activity. We can do that with an aggregate query. Say select type and then sum calories from exercise logs. And then we're going to group by type. Now I can see each type with how many calories I've burned total for that type of exercise. Now, do you notice how the column shows up as some calories in the results? If we want, we can actually tell SQL to give that column a new name, just by writing as, and then giving it the new name, total calories. That can make our results easier to read, and it also has another benefit, which we'll use later. So next, I want to filter the results to only show activities where I've burned more than 150 calories total across all the times I've done that exercise. It turns out that 150 calories is the amount in one ounce of dark chocolate, so it seems like a good amount to shoot for. Now, my first instinct might be using where to filter. Like if I took this query here and then said, where calories greater than 150? Then we only see dancing and we don't see biking, which we would expect to see. The reason we only see dancing is because it filters each individual row that comes in. And dancing is the only exercise where I burned more than 150 calories in a single log. But what I want to know is which exercise type or types have I burned more than 150 calories across all of the logs for that exercise type? We actually have to use something new for that, which is the having clause. To use that, we'll remove this where, and then after the group by, we'll write having, and then total calories greater than 150. Ta-da! Now we see biking because now it's actually looking at the total calories and I've indeed earned more than 150 over time in my logs. So as you can see, 
Those two queries are actually different, but they are easy to confuse. When we use having, we're applying the conditions to the grouped values, not the individual values in the individual rows. We could use any aggregate function on a grouped column that makes sense. Sum, min, max, average, whatever we want to check. Let's do another example. So if we want to see the average calories for all the exercises where we burn, let's say more than 50 average total. Oh, that's all of them. So let's up it. 100 in the middle, still doing good, 70, cool. So you can see we can play around with that query there, get different results with that having. Now let me do something a little different. Let's say we want to see all the exercise where we logged at least two activities for that type of exercise. For that, we're going to use a count function. So I'll select type from exercise logs, group by type, and then having count star, doesn't matter what column, so we can just do star, greater than or equal to two. Okay, so now we can see biking, dancing, tree climbing. I've done all of those at least two times. Makes sense because those are my three favorite activities in life. Besides coding, of course. Okay, so now you've seen having. Remember that it's easy to confuse having with where when using these aggregate functions. So think through your results and make sure they make sense. And now you get to try it yourself. Remember, an aggregate function is anything that's using like multiple rows of data to give you those results, right? So that's whenever you see average or sum or any of those, we want to be careful and make sure we're using the having keyword instead of the um, where keyword. And it's very easy to say, oh, where are the average calories are 70 or greater than 70. But then we're only looking at those individual rows worth of data. We're not looking at, hey, what was the sum of all of those? That's what we're trying to filter down on. So let's take a look at that challenge. Database authors and books, word counts. In the first step, select all the authors um, who have written more than 1 million words using group by and having. Your search results table should include the author and their total word count as a total words column. Okay, so we are going to say, hey, select. And what do we want to come out? We want the author title, whoa, select. We want the author title to come out. And we also want the sum of their words to come out. But they want me to call that total words. So I'm going to say as total words. This is just an alias. This just allows us to change the name of the column in our results. So we now say from. It's all coming from our books table. But if I look at this, um, I've got an issue. If I just select everything, right? If I say select star from my books, I can see um, that I am not filtering down by, uh, I'm not using my group by and I'm not using my having. So I need to do that. I need to say, hey, group by the author. by the author. Let me take uh, that out. Okay. Now I've got them grouped properly so that I can see their total words. If I don't do that group by, you'll notice that I'm actually getting the sum of all of the authors. And I'm like, but there are three different authors. I need to group the authors together so only their books get added together. So I say group by author, and now I've got it broken out into their totals, but I want it only where the total words is greater than a million. But it's not where because it's a sum function. Because it's a sum function, I instead use my having my total words, the alias that I just used for the column is greater than uh, one 
million dollars. Make sense? Because the restriction is applying to the aggregate function we use having instead. All right, last thing. Oh, I thought last thing. Why didn't it give me? Oh, okay, I already moved on. Now select all the authors that have an average of more than 150,000 words per book. Your results table should include the author of the average words as an average words column. Okay, so we still want to select the author and we want the average words as a v g words from our books table and this time um we are going to group by and we want to still group by the author because we're grouping their books and then we want to say having average words that is greater than 100 and 50,000. Group by, group by. I need to go get some group in my stomach. I'm hungry. All right, before we go on break, you either have to come off of mute and tell me how you're feeling about this or post in chat. I would text, but um, I had too much groove <laughs> just now. Um, but honestly, this type of coding, I like better than what we've learned so far. It's a little bit more uh, comprehensible for me. Um, <laughs> so... I do like this and I can see how I would um, implement it within my capstone. So thanks. Good. Shay, totally fine. Need more time with it. We will definitely be doing that. Making sense, better grasp on concepts, good. All right, go on break, be back at 7.27. How are we feeling about Khan Academy so far? Are we liking this format? Are we liking the pacing? Do we wanna go faster? Do we wanna go slower? Do you want to say, dear God, don't do it the second day of this tomorrow? How are we feeling in general? This is a little, a little different than what we're used to. Any thoughts? Positive vote for Khan Academy from Shakota. Anyone else? Just feeling pretty neutral about it? Good? Okay. Let's go ahead and dive back in there. Um, so I'm not going to make you guys read this entire um, article, but it's basically saying, hey, we're writing all of these SQL queries right now, but eventually we won't be the ones, you know, writing it or executing it every time. Um, <laughs> we're going to have our app basically be able to do that, right? Um, so they showed you a little wireframe. They say software engineers are the ones who can write server-side logic, the ones that are going to be building their APIs. Oh, thank you. Their APIs um, are going to be executing the SQL queries. So software engineers can write them. Um, data scientists can do them, right? Uh, that notion of we've got a lot of data out there 
data isn't really helpful. What is helpful is information. Data scientists may work with the database directly, even though they might not be the ones loading in that data. They might be, but um, those data scientists are going to be the one whose job it is excuse me, to make something um, out of that data to actually learn uh, information from it. Um, product management might be involved in this, right? They may say, hey, we released this feature. We really want to know how many people are using it. And in order to do that, we need to look at the data flowing in. Um, they may look at uh, usage statistics. They may want to figure out, hey, how many people who use this feature also use this feature over here? And based off of that, that's how we're going to prioritize what's more important, what bugs we're going to need to fix, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so lots of different people who can execute SQL queries. Um, obviously, we fall under the software engineer uh, section where we're going to learn how to do that server side, but lots of different people who can execute SQL. All right, let's keep going. Let's try a few more advanced SQL features. Let me just reshare my screen because I don't know if sound held. Yeah, it did. Okay, try that again. Uh... I've been logging heart rate for each of my exercises and I haven't done anything interesting with this data yet. So now it's time. I did a little research on the internet and I found that the maximum heart rate is 220 minus your age. So one thing I can do is query my logs to see if my heart rate ever goes above max, since that would be pretty scary or tell me that there's something wrong with my heart rate checking device. Okay, to do that, I'm going to do a count star. Uh, so count star from exercise logs, and then where heart rate greater than 220 minus my age, 30. Ooh, there's no results, and that makes my heart happy. Now, notice I'm using the subtraction operator. And in fact, I can use most math operators in SQL, like to add, subtract, multiply, or divide. And if I need to, just like in math, I can throw in parentheses and change the order of evaluation. All right, so we confirmed that my heart doesn't go above max. That's good. Now let's look to see if my heart gets into the target heart rate zone. And that is 50 to 90% of max. So we're going to start with our count star and we just need to change our where. So this time we're going to say heart rate is greater than, and let's look at 50% of max. So that's 220 minus 30. Okay. So you see, I'm combining a few math operators here. I'm going to also throw in the round function just to show you that we can use that function. It's pretty nifty. And then we're going to say and, and I'll just copy paste this and change it to less than 90. Let's go ahead and throw a equals in there. All right. So now we're checking to see 59% of max and we see there are four logs that fall in that target zone. But what about my other logs? What zones are they in? We don't know. All we know is that four of them are in that target zone. The, the rest could be maybe they're 90 to 100%, maybe they're less than 50%. What I would really like to see is a summary of all my logs and how many were in each of the heart rate zones. Now that sounds like a situation where I would use a group by, like group by this column that says which heart rate zone this row is in. But I don't actually have a column like that to group by. Well, I can effectively create a column using the case statement. Now I'll admit that I find this the trickiest statement to use in SQL. So I struggle with it a bit and don't worry if you find it a bit odd as well. It is it's similar to an if or a switch from programming languages, if you're familiar with those. Otherwise, don't worry about it. All right, so I'm going to use case, but I'm just going to start with outputting what we know, which is type and heart rate from exercise logs and see what that looks like. Okay, now for each of these rows, I want to add a new column that says which zone the heart rate is in. To do that, I go into the select part of the query and I'm going to write case to begin the case statement. Then I type 
when and the first condition which is checking if it's above max so that was heart rate greater than 220 minus 30 then I write then and an expression which is just a string so we'll say above max okay so this is my my first case now I'm going to keep going with my other conditions. So when heart rate is greater than 90, then we'll say it's above target. And then, so if greater than 90, and then we'll say at that point, if it's greater than 50, we can say it's within target. And everything else would be below target, so I could do another condition for that, but I can also just be lazy or smart, however you want to think of it, and say else below target. Okay, now my conditions are all done, but I haven't told SQL what to name this new column. For that, I write end as hr zone. Awesome. So now for each of the rows, I can see the new column with a nice description of what zone they're in. Now that we've done that, finally, I can make a query that summarizes how many of my logs are in each of the zones. And that is a whole lot easier now that I've set up this case. I'm just going to take this query here, copy it, and I'm going to group by the new column we created, and then add count star get rid of the heart rate Let's see what we have here aha and now we see that we've got four below target and four within target that's pretty neat huh that case statement it is a tricky one but it sure is handy once you get the hang of it you may not use it all the time but it's good to know just in case terrible puns aside so basically saying, all right, we've got if statements here, and we can basically set this up to say, all right, <clears throat> when these conditions are true, this is how I would like you to label it or make it show up in our results. We don't use a ton of case statements in our own code, but it's worth getting a little, a little practice with them. So let's dive into that. The reason why we don't use the case statements a lot, I should clarify that, is that when we get these results back, when we're in SQL, we have to write our SQL query in order to show that data, right? But when we're writing our, our code, when we're querying the database, we're going to be doing that in JavaScript itself. So oftentimes, it's much easier to work with the data in the JavaScript than it is to work with it in SQL, only because we're much more familiar with our JavaScript syntax, right? So oftentimes, we would just write that query and then go ahead and write out the if statements in the JavaScript. But if you are a database engineer, if you're creating a bunch of reports, if you're working with huge data sets, for example, I worked with a, a data set that had 14 million rows in it. It was every uh, insurance claim um, done in the state of uh, one of the Midwest states, maybe Wisconsin, uh, over a three-year period. And it was literally every insurance claim that had gotten submitted there. Well, I started writing out this code in JavaScript to do some data analysis on it, and my computer just cracked itself. It was like, nope, cannot do that. Well, there's only so much memory that our computers have to run the JavaScript, but databases are really optimized for these large data sets. They know how to run these queries in chunks instead of having to take every single row into memory and then analyze them. The database is much better at managing that data, only taking sections of it in memory and doing it from there. So. Um, there are times that uh, we cannot use that in JavaScript, that we've got too much data that we need to load it into our query. So anyway, let's get some practice. All right, we're tracking uh, student grades, name, number grade, and what uh, percent of activities they've completed. In this first step, select all the rows and display the uh, name, number grade, and percent completed, which you can compute by multiplying and rounding the fraction completed column. OK, um, so come down here, select the name, number grade, 
And actually, you know what? I'm going to give you guys a chance to do this one, and then I'll come back to you. So just give you guys a minute to work on it.
All right, we ready for solutions or does anyone need an extra minute? Okay, let's take a look. So we are displaying the name, number grade, and percent completed. And we have to figure out how to do this percent completed calculation. So I'm going to click on the table, and it has a fraction completed. And I'm like, OK, well, fraction completed, how do we convert from a fraction to a decimal to a percent? We multiply by 100, and then we round that last number off. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We are going to say, hey, what we want to display is not everything. We only want to display the name and the number grade, which are already uh, fractions coming from this table. But we also want to calculate this thing by rounding the fraction completed times 100. And we want to call that the percent completed. Good. Anyone have questions on that? All right. Now this next one is tricky. And I actually wasn't able to get this one fully functioning. So let's see what happens here. So first of all, it's saying we are trying to get the letter grade, where if it is above an A, it's a 9. Uh, if it's above a 90, it's an A. If it's uh, um, between an 80 and a 90, it's a B, C, and then F otherwise. Then use count and group by to show the total number of students um, with each one of those grades. Okay, so first we got to get our letter grade working. So I want to make sure that um, that the number grade matches up with the letter grade. So I'm going to start by saying select their name, the number grade. Um, And I need to figure out their letter grade. So in order to figure out their letter grade, I'm going to make a case statement. And what I like to do is go down to the bottom of that case statement and say, hey, this is the end. And we are going to end it as their letter grade. Now we need to tell it what are the cases. So we're going to say when the number grade is greater than 90, then that's going to be an A. We continue that down and say, if it is uh, above an 80, it's a B. And when it is above a 70, then it's going to be a C. Else, it's all going to be an F. And we are finally going to select all of that from the student grades table. So I save that and I now see, hey, 95 is an A because 90 is not above the number 90, it's greater than or equal to. That person got a B, sucks to suck. We got an F here, 66, and a 76 here. All right. Okay, and now they're saying, um, now that we know this is working, they're saying then you can use count with group by to show the number of students with each one of those grades. Well, if we just did our count without the group by, it wouldn't properly count these Bs. So what we need to say is group by the letter grade. And when we do that, we see the grouping starts to work. And then we also want to say count the letter grades. And if we then take out, oh, I put that in the wrong spot, sorry. We can now take out our name, number, uh, and our number grade and see, hey, we've got one person with an A, three people with a B, one person with a C, and one person with an F. Now, what I don't know is why 
I'm not getting the validation to go on to the next step here. Did anyone have success or make it that far? Select count star. Nope. Um, case. Like, yeah, if you had count star like between select and case. Um, remove the, yep. Stupid. No, not, not you. I mean, Khan Academy <laughs> is stupid. Thank you, thank you. We met those requirements. It's just the test cases that was dumb. True, true. Thank you, Plash. So are you saying the syntax doesn't have to be written exactly like that? That's it? Yeah. So in this case, like it wasn't happy that I had put the um like if i put the count down here i would make the argument that i am still showing the number of students with each one of those grades here are their grades here are their count now what khan academy is saying is like the order of the columns matter and and in the order yes it does matter if i take this count and move it up here then that will be the first column and the um number grade will be the second column to me, it doesn't matter, right? The table is the table. I can read that data. I can understand it. But to Khan Academy, they were specifically looking for the order of the columns. So that's just why we had to change it up. Questions on this? Now, you may notice that I'm starting to put in my line breaks here. SQL doesn't care about line breaks, right? As long as it's not in the middle of a word. Um, I could put four things in here. I could put uh, enter in down here. I could move this up to the same line. And as long as I have spaces, uh, not line breaks, but spaces between them, it does not care at all. So SQL is pretty flexible with the line breaks. But this is a situation where it starts to get a lot harder to read if we put all of those whens on the same line. So you just want to be careful with your line spacing, kind of make it a little bit more legible for you to read. Um, and that can help you make sure that you get your statements formed properly. Good? OK. Um, let me just take a quick look at the sidebar. Yep, we're good there. Again, if you want to practice with these uh, projects, you definitely can. Um, there are some interesting data sets that they have linked in here, everything from NBA players to Pokemon stats. Um, and you can uh, practice doing some analysis on them, finding average, min, max, all of that kind of stuff. So um, again, totally optional to do this. But if you feel like you're looking for extra SQL practice, um, SQL Bolt is listed as an optional homework assignment now in Canvas. Um, there is also the week 17 homework that I just uploaded that won't be due until Sunday. We will be covering that topic. Um, we will be covering that topic on Wednesday. Um, and there's some optional readings also in, um, in Canvas. So lots of resources for you there if you're looking for additional practice. Onwards and upwards. Max. Oh, yeah. At how many lessons are required in order to um, not have to be in class tomorrow again? Just lesson one or as far as we went tonight? All of unit three. So you okay. need to work ahead because tomorrow we just finished um, the more advanced SQL queries. And then we're going to get started on relational queries tonight. And then tomorrow we're going to cover modifying databases um, and go from there. So again, unit three will be homework for tonight. Okay. If you want to attend, if you don't want to attend class tomorrow, yes. Now, if we do it and we attend class tomorrow, again, what are we going over tomorrow? Uh, relational queries and modifying databases. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, let's go ahead and dive on in unless anyone has questions or would like to see how something works. Okay.
Okay, so we have to talk a little bit about database design here, right? So let's say that we are um, looking at this table, right? Student name, student email, the um, subject of the test and the grade that they got on it. Well, we also may have information about the books that that student has read. But we're taking a concept here that we have learned in our code and we're applying it over in the database. Dry, don't repeat yourself. Well, what we have here is we've got Peter Rabbit in the database twice. And we've also got him up here because Peter took two different scores. Um, we also have a breakdown of that student's information. Well, what happens if Peter gets married and changes his last name? Now we can't just go to the users, the students table and change his last name. We also need to go update the name in the books that they've read and also in the test scores. That seems fraught with peril. What happens if you update it in two of the tables and forget in the other one? Well, which one happens to be the right last name? So instead, what we do is we start breaking down our data. And we say, you know what? The student's table, the student's detail is going to be the, the ultimate source of truth. We're only going to put that person's name in the table once in students. But then what we're going to do is we're going to take this student ID and we're going to update the test table so it's storing that student's ID. Now, this makes it a little bit harder for us to read the data, but we can do something called a join, which we're going to learn in uh, the next uh, video of how we can pull that data back together. We also practice that same uh, idea with our student ID. We have it referencing or relating to data in another table. We also would run into that issue if we've got multiple books. Well, what happened up here, um, two people took out the book called Jabberwocky, right? And we don't want to duplicate that data. So what we end up doing, we make a books table, and then we actually end up with a table with only two columns, who took out the book and what book it was. So it's okay to repeat the book ID because you can take out the same book by, by different people, right? IDs are fine to replicate, data itself is not. Let's see how we can relate all of that together. I've set up two tables in this database, a student's table with detailed information about each student, like their name and email, and a student grades table, which has their student ID, test name, and grade. Let's see what happens if we just select everything from student grades. Ta -da. Okay, so we see student IDs, test names, and grades. I'd actually rather be able to see student names, emails, that sort of thing. Now, what you might notice is that the student ID in student grades is related to the ID in students. So this one here is actually referring to Peter Rabbit. And this two here is actually referring to Alice in Wonderland. Now, I want to form a query that will output the student name and email next to each test grade. And that information is in two different tables. So that means I need to join the tables. And there are a few ways that we can do that in SQL. And we'll try them all out, actually. The simplest is called a cross join. And I can make that happen just by putting both table names after the from. Ta ta. So as you can see, lots of rows. And basically, what this did is that for each row in the first table, it created a row for each of these rows here. That means we end up with eight rows because it creates four rows for each of these two rows. This is the simplest join, but it's also the least useful. We don't want every row matched with every other row. We only want them matched if the student ID matches. Now we can do that using an inner join. 
which isn't actually much more work at all and is way more useful. So there's actually a few ways of doing an inner join. We'll start with just building off the last query and we can add a where. And it, the where will check to see that the student ID matches student's ID. All right, so now we actually have what we wanted is test grades next to names because it's done the cross join and then just limited to the rows where those columns were the same. Great. This syntax here is called an implicit inner join and it works, but it's not actually the best practice. The better way is if we do something called an explicit inner join. And that is using the join keyword. So to do that, we're going to start with just doing from one table. And actually, I'll do from students and then join on student grades. And then instead of where, we do on. And that specifies what columns are being matched. So on students.id equals students grade dot student ID. All right, so now we have the same results as before. Switch, but really the same. Now that I have these tables joined, I'm just going to whittle down the columns I'm outputting to the names, the email, the test name, and the grade. OK, beautiful. Now, the cool thing is, once we've done joins, we can still use where and group by and all those fancy things. Like, let's say that we want to filter down the results to just grades greater than 90. Woohoo! Let's see. Oh, no. Uh, great, great. There we go. Haha. -ha. Lots of ones above 90. Now I can email all those students with a high five. Okay, but what would happen if my tables both contain columns with the same column name but different meanings? Like right now, our student grades table has a grade column. But what if my students table also had a grade column for their overall class grade? That would mean down here, when we selected grade, it wouldn't know which table to pull it from because there's, there'd be a grade column in both of our tables. So actually, to be super safe, we should prefix our columns with the table name that they're from. So we say students.firstname, students.lastname, students.email, studentgrades.test, studentgrades.grade. OK, now we know that we're going to get the columns from the table we expect them to be in. Great. Now that is our basic explicit inner join. And it is what you'll use for most of your joins across related tables. But if you stay tuned, I'll show you a few other types of joins as well. Please try to contain all of your excitement for table joins. This is really the heart of a relational database, though. The ability to uh, say, hey, a lot of this data is shared across multiple things. Let's learn, and on Wednesday, we will actually learn how to do database design to properly store data, structure our tables to make sure we don't have anything replaced. Okay, in this one, um, come on, let me reset it. Um, we are, uh, we've created a database of people and hobbies, and each row, uh, the hobbies are related to, uh, to the row in the person's table via the person ID. In the first step, insert one or more uh, row in the person's table, then insert one or more row, uh, then insert one more row, excuse me, in hobbies that's related to that newly inserted person. So insert person, then insert a hobby related to that person. Give you guys a minute to work on that. Max. Yes. Well, while I'm doing this um, mm -hmm. question, 
So you remember back when we did the grid project um, and you were telling us how bootstrap, it doesn't equal grids, columns, and rows, but we would utilize that for things as such. If we were to implement, um, if we were to include bootstrap into this, would it just primarily, you whoa, know? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Two different languages. Okay, no, yeah. I'm sorry. Thanks. Each HTML and CSS go together, right? Those are two languages that work together. SQL does not go into our HTML at all. We have to have multiple layers. We have to have our JavaScript make an API call. We have to build a server to respond to that API call. We have to connect the server to the database to get the SQL information. That SQL information is going to come back as an array of objects. We then use that array of objects to send that JSON back to the front end. And then once the front end gets it, then we can use HTML and use something like Bootstrap to format a table or a grid uh, to make this information show up. So it is possible ultimately to, to integrate Bootstrap with SQL, but you need every layer of the stack in order to be able to pull that off. So let's say for instance, I'm doing a meal prep app and I want the nutritional values to populate and I want it to be pulled from a different website or server. This right here is what I would utilize to... Um, you would only well. use this if you were storing the information in your own database. If you, yeah. were, if you were retrieving the information from someone else's database, you would be using an API to do so. Okay. And that will be more clear by the end of next week, right? Because we're focused only on the database right now. Next week, we learn how to set up an API server. And once we get that API server set up, we can go back to our SQL knowledge and practice uh, saving that information through to and from the API that we're building into the database. Okay, thank you for the clarification on that. Mm-hmm. Let's give this one a try. We are inserting a new person. So we're going to say insert into persons the name and their age and the values of me and an age. Now we've run into a problem, though. We've inserted that person, but we need to know what that person's ID is. So I'm going to say select the name and the ID from my person's table. And that is going to show me, hey, I got ID number six when I got inserted into the table. Now that I know that that's my ID, I can come down here and insert into the hobbies. And I'm going to use the person ID which is coming from my uh, person's table and the name of the hobby and the values I'm going to give it is an ID of six because I want to link it to me and the hobby will be coding. And now I am done, step one. Hey Max, I have a question. Yeah. Do I have to put the persons when I'm inserting it all the way up with the rest of the persons or I mean it's obviously working with it all the way down here but is it like... as long as you insert the person before you insert the hobby then no you don't need to group them together okay but to keep it neat is it like it would be better yes to put it up here okay uh, now select two tables with a join so that you can see each person's name next to their hobby. Okay, so I'm going to say select, and I want to select from the person's table their name. And then I also want to select from the hobby's table the hobby's name. So you notice I'm using that dot notation here because if I just said name, it wouldn't know if I meant the name of the hobby or the name of the person. So I need to be specific with those. And I'm going to say from my person's table, but I am going to inner join on the um, hobbies table on, and what uh, do I want to line up? 
I want to line up where the hobbies dot person ID equals the persons dot ID. And I probably got that syntax wrong. So I'm going to have to cheat and go back to the last example. OK. Um, I want to say select person's name and the hobby's name from uh, join hobbies on Hobbies person ID, persons ID. Lash, go ahead, give me the answer. Does it matter like if we switch the keywords persons and hobbies? Um, it would because hobbies has the person. Oh, you mean here, here yeah, and here? It, yeah, after join and after on, after from, yep. It shouldn't, and I'm gonna be really pissed off if it does. Nope, we're still getting everyone and we shouldn't be. Join. But why? Because we are, we want, we are pulling everyone, right? Like, do we need to add a condition like where we want only one person? Is that what you're doing? Well, it says select uh, the two tables with a join so that you can see each person's name next to their, oh, is it a, hold on. Hobbies that, yeah um as hobby and then do you want me to switch these two uh, maybe uh here is what i have done and it's kind of like working for me oh but i did that right <laughs> it's being wonky. Oh, is it? You know what? Did I do? I have an extra select up here. Nope. Oh, screw it. I'm just going to copy and paste it. If it works, it works. Okay. I have no idea why. Stupid yeah. test cases, but. Yeah, they're coded as wonky. As long as you guys understand the, the basic of the join that's and the syntax, that's 10 times more important than the fact that you got the, the green check mark. We understand how it's basically saying, hey, take all of the information from this table, take all the information from this table and line it up so that the person ID matches the ID over here. Because these two tables are related together, now if I want to get the person's name or age and also the hobby's name, we can get all of that information from one table. Good? Okay. Now Wait. add an addition. Oh, question. Can you, sorry, can you move it back up so I could see? where you um, inserted the name. Oh yeah, uh, up here. Okay. And then also right here. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, okay, add an additional query that only shows the names and hobbies of Bobby McBoatface, Bobby McBobby face, excuse me, um, using join combined with aware. So we are going to reuse this join, um, except we are going to say where the person's name is equal to Bobby McBoatface. McBobby face should be Boatface. And that test case liked me and worked. Jacrota, do you get that insert working or do you need help with that? I'm still trying to 
work on it. I think I'm a little lost, but. Okay. I'm going to ask Palash his question and then I'll come to you if you still want to recover. Okay. Go ahead. Underline 31 and 32, like, will it matter, like, if you uh, exchange, trade the positions of hub, the word hobbies and persons, like, from hobbies, join persons to from persons, join hobbies? I know it's not like in here, but in real life. Works exactly the same. Okay. As long as the condition is the same and we're pulling the right. Correct. The order. It will use the order of the uh, columns in the select anyway. Um, so it doesn't matter which one you're joining on which. Gotcha. Now, if you're joining multiple tables, sometimes if you're joining multiple tables, it will matter. Um, but if it's just two tables, it won't. Thank you. Okay, so quick recap of this. And Shakota, uh, interrupt me at any point. The first thing we needed to do was insert a new person. So we inserted me right here and we said name and age. The problem is, is that I need to know what ID I just got as that person. So what I'm going to do is log out my name and ID from the person's table. And now I can see I got an ID of six. So now when I want to insert a hobby about myself, I'm gonna use that person ID of six when I insert my hobby right down here. Now, to get both the name of the hobby and the name of me as a person, I'm going to select the person's name and the hobby's name from the hobby's table. But now I need to tell it how the hobby's table knows what it matches to in the person's table. So that's when I do my join to the person's table. And I say, hey, the person ID from the hobbies table lines up with the ID in the person's table. What that ends up outputting is that I can see the person's name from the person's table and the hobby name from the hobbies table all in one result, even though it's coming from two separate tables. Make sense? And then we just threw a where query on the bottom of it. And we said, hey, we only care about like Bobby face. Good? Yep. Cool. Um, this will be our last one and then we'll call it the night. I'm back with my related tables about students, uh, with the students and the student grades. And I added a new table to keep track of what projects students are working on. And once again, this one has a student ID to relate it to the students table, just like the students grade had. And it also has a title for each project. Now what I want is a list of student names and the projects they're working on. So that means I need to join student projects with students. We can do that, as you probably guess, using an inner join that we just learned. So what are we what do we want? So we want students dot first name. We want students dot last name. Uh, we want the title of the project so from the students projects table. And then we'll say from students join student projects and on students dot ID equals student projects dot student ID. All right, so I see one project, Peter, and his very promising keratopult experiment. But where is my other student, Alice? Well, we're missing Alice because an inner join only creates rows if there are matching records in the two tables. There's no row for Alice because there's no row in student projects that has Alice's student ID in it. And this makes sense, and oftentimes with joins, we do only want rows where the records matched. But in this case, we want a comprehensive list of every student and their project, and we want every student to be on that list, even if they don't have a project yet. And that is where an outer join is super useful. 
and it's really easy to use. We're just going to go right here and type left outer. Ta-da! Now we see Alice and there's a big old null for the project title. Okay, so how this works is that the left tells SQL that it should make sure to retain every row from the left table, which is the one after the from, students. And the outer tells it that it should retain the rows even if there's no match in the right table, which is students projects. And that's our outer join. And there's a, a lot of cases where you might find you want an outer join. And just keep in mind that the behavior of inner versus outer joins. There are also some other sort of outer joins. There's a right outer join. And it basically does the opposite, is make sure that it keeps everything from the right and then joins with the left. Um, we don't actually support right outer joins here, but if you want that, you can just switch the table order and it's the same thing. So you don't actually need to have a right outer join. Um, you can always use left outer join. And there's also something called a full outer join, and that matches rows, if it can, on both the left and the right side and fills in nulls when it can't on either side. And that's, that's pretty interesting, but also is not supported in our environment here. And that is one of the interesting things about learning SQL. I'm showing you lots of things that work here and work in other SQL environments, but every environment is a little different. So you'll constantly be tweaking the tools in your SQL toolbox for each new environment. And that's true about a lot of things with computers, honestly. You'll learn the general techniques and then learn how to adapt it for a specific language or app or environment. And you basically just get really good at learning. So, yay. <laughs> All right, let's finish off strong here. I'm yawning way too much. Uh, inner joins, you'll use 95% of the time. Um, every now and then you will want uh, to be able to get all of the students, regardless of whether or not they have information in another table. Um, that is when you would use a left join or a right join. Um, there are six, one, two, three, four, five, six. There are seven kinds of joins. Um, like I said, you'll use an inner join 90% of the time. You'll use either a left or a right join the other 8% of the time. And I don't think I've ever needed the other 2% of the time, which are the other types of table joins that she just covered. Um, but let's finish this off with a challenge and call it an evening. You're actually really close to finishing, which means we will have more time tomorrow to dive into more fun things like setting up our SQL environment and practicing with our data. Okay, uh, we've got a database of customers and their orders. Not all the customers have made orders, however, come up with a query that lists the name of every customer followed by the item and the price of the orders that they have made. Use a left outer join so that the customer is listed even if they have made no orders and don't add any um, order by. Go ahead, give that a stab and we will work on it next.
All right, so the, for the first one, we want to be careful with the name because we have, oh, we don't actually have a collision here, but it is always better to specify the name of the table and the name of the column if we are going to do a join and select from multiple tables. So we are selecting the customer's name and the customer's email. We're also going to the orders table and pulling out the item and the price. We're doing that from our customer's table, why? Now here, Palash order does matter because here we want to get all of the customers, but not necessarily all of the orders. In this case, all of the orders have a customer, so it's not a problem. But here we want to say, go list all the customers. That means that even though um, Captain Awesome has not ordered any items, we still get them in the table. That's the difference between the inner join and the outer join. The outer join is going to include all of the customers, but it might not include all of the orders. So we want to think about it kind of as a Venn diagram, right? An inner join is looking at just that inner section of the Venn diagram. A left outer join is taking all of the customers and all of the order information that overlaps with those customers, but not necessarily all of the order information if that order didn't contain a customer. See if I can finish this all out in the last two minutes. Uh, result in one row per each customer with their name, email, total amount of money they've spent on orders. Sort the rows according to the total money spent from the most spent to the least spent. Okay. So we are selecting um, the customer's name and customer's email again. From our customers, we are going to... Um, left outer join our orders again. Um, we also want to include the sum of their orders dot price, but we need to group that by the customer's ID. And that is going to uh, I missed something because it's all the same price. Um, oh, thank you. I need to on my customers ID is equal to my orders dot customer ID. And now we are seeing the sum of how much Doctor Who has spent and the sum that Harry Potter has spent. And then we should also technically do an order by the um, something like as sum. And then we can order by the sum down here. Now it's grouped and sorted. Oh, did I sort it in the wrong direction? Um, sort the rows, total money spent from most spent, yeah. So uh, this wasn't actually covered, but we should be able to, to sort it descending instead of ascending, and that um, flips the order of sort. All right, you're all SQL experts. You don't need me for the rest of the week. Go have fun. Just kidding. I've got a couple more lessons to cover tomorrow. Um, we will probably have extra time to actually get your environment set up. So you'll have a database running locally, and then we will dive in from there. Hopefully did not bore you all to death. Have a good night. I will see you all tomorrow for more SQL fun. And I will stick around if anyone has questions. All right. Have a good night, everyone. See ya.